Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory, to him, to him be glory, to him, and 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 glory, to Immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory, let him and glory, let him and glory, let him and glory, let him and glory, and glory, let him and glory, and glory, and and glory, let him and glory, and and glory, and and glory, and 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 than all we ask or imagine. I have a daughter who's five years old. She's got a lot of energy. We have some dreams for her, you see. She's putting on mama's shoes Cause she wants to be a lady And that's just what we want for her to be I want to grow older I want to feel the rain of the Joy to the world the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Wow, good morning. morning. It's good to be here. Just a quick reminder. We're here to feel the warmth and the security of being loved by our Heavenly Father. Isn't that great? And those around us. The problem is our understanding is so limited sometimes. But we trust that all things work out together for those that love God, Romans 8, 28. 
and we live by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to be together, to share together, to be able to gain strength together knowing that you are in control of life. Father, that's hard for us to understand. It's way deeper and our emotions are so difficult at times with things that happen to us. Father, we pray that we'll trust in you. Father, we know you've promised us beyond all of our expectations something that cannot be taken away from us. Father, help us to worship you, to praise you, to understand you, to be a servant to you in all things that we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. Love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. Love a sight just to see all the happy faces. 
Praising God in heavenly places, what a thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. Oh, what joy his love affords when we meet on one accord and we lift our hearts in praise unto the Lord. There's no place I'd rather be than with the ones who've been set free. I'm so glad I'm in God's great big family. I love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. Love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. Love the sight just to see all the happy faces praising God in heavenly places. What a thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. On that great reunion day, when our Lord says, come away, and the saints from every land swim through the gates, the hearing loved ones round the throne, at length I'll be gathered home. That will be the greatest thrill I've ever known. I love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. Love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. What a sight just to see all the happy faces Praising God in heavenly places, what a thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. morning. If you didn't have an opportunity to get the Lord's Supper, now would be a good time to go get the cup and the bread. When we get together for communion, we remember many different things. Sometimes our thoughts are just scattered all over the place, and we just need to focus and remember that it is because of God's love that we all have this opportunity. We as believers have the benefit of his blood that we are able to come directly before God and to thank him for this sacrifice that he is giving to us. So we want to say thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, Christ, for that wonderful and terrible sacrifice. Romans 12.5 says that we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. As we think about that, let's take this bread that represents the body of Christ. His body. This unleavened bread represents no sin, and he had no sin, the only one living that could ever save him. As we partake of this unleavened bread, let us be mindful of the body of Christ 
and they'll sacrifice what we give. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your love that it encompasses all sin. You allowed your son to come to this world to die that we might all have this opportunity to partake of this in remembrance of his life on this earth. And as we partake of this unleavened bread, help us to be mindful that he is coming back. And until that day, we are so thankful for this emblem that we have to remember him by. Thank you, Father, for your love. We pray this in Christ's name. In Hebrews 10, 19, it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. It is only through his blood that we have this possibility of being cleansed in order to even approach the holy of holies. And so when we take this fruit of the vine that represents the blood of Christ. Let's do so in a manner that's pleasing to God and help us as as individuals to be mindful that we need to ask for forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, that great sacrifice that was given through the life of your son, the blood that he shed upon that cross that gives us this opportunity to be complete to approach your throne, your throne and to approach you in prayer and in, in thought. Help us, Father, as we live our daily lives to continue to turn to you and, and ask for your help in our life. Because of this blood that was shed for us, we have this opportunity of eternal life. And we thank you for that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Because of this love and because of the many blessings that we have, and especially in this country, we just, we want to give back a part of that that we take for granted many times. We want to thank the elders here for the over, oversight that they have of the money and the places that it goes. Let's just pray. We are just so thankful and, and grateful, Father, for the ability that we have in this country, especially, to have an abundance. And we just ask and pray that you help us to be grateful and loving and caring enough to give back a portion that you so richly blessed us with. Bless the hands of the people that oversee the money. And we just are so thankful that we have the leadership that we have. Thank you, Father. We ask and pray for your direction in our lives. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. If you have children that need to go to Bible, um, please do that at this time as we stand and sing, Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. 
I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. And it bathed my heart in love and wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us have a little about our troubles. He will answer the faintest cry. Answer by and by now when you feel a little prayerful yearning as your heart is heaven is turning and that little talk with Jesus makes it right. Sometimes my past seems drear when out of a ray of cheer and then a little tide will have an of day. The mist of sin may rise and hide the starry skies, but just a little talk with Jesus makes it flow Let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry, answer by and by. Give a prayerful yearning as your heart into heaven is turning. We'll find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Titus chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 5 through 9. It says, for this reason, I left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed not quickly tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving, what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able to both to exhort in sound doctrine, doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Good morning, Eastwood family. I don't know if sometimes that uh, you come to uh, services, uh, maybe you have a little bit of a heavy heart. I feel like I have a little bit of a heavy heart this morning as I think about those that are suffering because of the tornadoes that uh, took place in the South and uh, you know states like Kentucky. Absolute devastation and loss. I know I've been praying fervently for them. Of course, uh, you may have heard in the call, about, call out that we had Friday of the, the tragic death of Travis Thrash, and uh, the initial planning is for his uh, memorial service to be this Wednesday at 5 o'clock. I was on the phone just a few minutes before services, Brother Jimmy Ray uh, Mead, who of course was minister here for many, many years. He's going to come, and we're going to uh, uh, work that, uh, that uh, funeral service together. And so I, I have a heavy heart. But I notice uh, in times of heaviness of heart, let's never forget that God is still good. And this is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice in him. Amen? And so I think the best thing that we can do to help out sir, uh, people that are suffering and grieving, pray for them, let's worship God, let's continue to do what God has called us to do. He was the 20th president of the United States of America. And James A. Garfield was baptized. He was immersed into Christ when he was 19 years old. Eight years later, he will preach his first sermon, and he ended it this way. Jesus will come again, not as a babe in helplessness, but as the King of kings and Lord of lords. James A. Garfield will go on to preach many other services. 
and revivals. He was part of a restoration church movement. When you look under religion of U.S. presidents, said that he was a member of the Church of Christ. And before he became president of the 20th president of the United States of America, is quoted as him saying this, because he would serve the church as an elder. He said, I resign the highest office in the land to become president of the United States. Now, I believe there's a lot of truth in the statement that he made. Because as we're going to read in the scriptures today, anybody that serves as an elder or an overseer, that's a noble task. Or another version says that's an honorable position. And it's a position that comes with great reward. Listen to what Peter wrote about those that will serve faithfully as elders and overseers in the Lord's church. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive a crown of glory that will never fade away. 1 Peter 5 and verse 4. That's not said about a president. It's not said about a prime minister or a premier. But it's said about an elder, a shepherd in the body of Christ. Now, for somebody to serve in such a noble office in the Lord's church, there's going to need to be qualities and qualifications about them so that they can serve God effectively, so that they can serve the local congregation effectively. We're going to go into detail in that here today and in our studies. Now, as we go through these different qualifications and qualities, don't say, well, that's just for them. You need to apply that to yourself as well because every one of these qualifications and qualities except for having children and having been married would apply to any of us about being blameless and hospitable and people that are generous. All of these things are going to apply to each and every one of us. And so as we go through that list, say, well, how am I doing in that area? But for those that have matured, in these areas. Those are the ones that are going to serve as examples for the congregation. Now, I'd like for you to consider this. As we go through this list here today, Bill read from Titus. We're going to study out of 1 Timothy chapter 3. As we go through this, here's a few cautions I have. Number one, let's not take an ultra-legalistic approach to these different categories that we're going to study. Because sometimes churches take Hurtful extremes in this. There is no perfect person. Even someone like James A. Garfield serving as an elder for many years, he was not a perfect man. There is no perfect elder. See, some churches make qualifications so difficult that they never have anybody serve as elders and deacons in their congregation. Now, the other issue is that they don't take these seriously at all, and that paralyzes the church. I think maybe here's a good word to apply. Qualities. We are looking at spiritual, relational, uh, uh, virtual, uh, virtuous qualities in this person. And do they have the, is there evidence in their life that they have these qualities? What does Hebrews 13, 7 say? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So if you have your Bible handy here this morning, let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to go ahead and read all the way through verse number 7. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to much wine, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. I believe the first quality that somebody that's going to serve the church as an elder or an overseer, they need to have that desire. That needs to be something that's heavy on their heart. That's something that they're willing to do. 
It, 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 if you have to coerce somebody, if you have to twist their arm, if you have to beg them to do it, they are not prepared to serve the church as an elder. It is not an honorary title for somebody to do. It is a work. What did he say? If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Some versions say work. It's a work that is to be done. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 and 3 says this about elders. Be shepherds of God's flock that are under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lordering it over those entrusted you, but being examples to the flock. Did you hear those words? Those are all working words. This is all service that they are willing to do for the local congregation. How tragic on rare occasion for somebody to get in as an elder and not be willing to do the work. So, quality number one, they need to have a desire to do the work. Now, let's look at some of these other ones. They need to be above reproach. They need to be above reproach. Now, again, this does not mean perfection, otherwise no elder would ever be able to serve. But we're looking at the entirety of one's life. And there's not one big glaring thing that would hinder them from serving. Strong's would say, it, 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 defining this word uh, above reproach, it's, it's somebody that's not arrestable. And so you think of somebody maybe like the patriarch Job that, that said in Job 1.1, 1, 1, he was a blameless man, an upright man who feared God and turned away from evil. Now, these next qualities, uh, I'm going to lump them together because I think that they fit. As we look at somebody being temperate, self-controlled, and respectable, temperate means sober-minded. Self-control, pretty easy to explain, that you keep your, yourself, your passions, your emotion, emotions under control. Respectable means orderly. And that's what, if you're going to have an influence on people in a positive way, you need to be clear-minded. You need to keep yourself under control. Respectable, probably a modern definition, would be he is considered to be a Christian gentleman. He has his life in order. He is a gentleman among God's people. The next qualification is that they are hospitable. Hospitable. This literally means somebody that's fond of guests, fond of strangers. Erdman, as he's commentating on this particular word, says in ancient inns or places of ill repute, then the Christian travelers were often poor. They hesitated uh, to place themselves under obligation to unbelievers, and thus by entertaining travelers, particularly if they were missionaries of the cross, the influence of the church could be extended while at the same time a spirit of love and sympathy could be shown. Now we all are familiar with the great uh, restoration preacher Alexander Campbell. He came from Ireland via Scotland and was very poor. But as he grew and matured and worked real hard in life, as he inherited a, a farm and a family estate, he became very, very wealthy. But he was known during his day as being very, very hospitable. He had a large family, 14 children. And they would set the table for 30, sometimes 60, because as travelers were coming through, whether foreign or domestic, they were always welcome at his table. He was extremely hospitable. And I believe hospitality can manifest itself in many, many ways. But this needs to be a quality, a characteristic of somebody serving as an elder. They need to be hospitable. Also, they need to have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Outsiders would be people outside the church. Now, why is that important? So that he won't fall into the devil's trap. Do you know that the devil is a really, really good trapper? He likes to snare people. As you study throughout scripture, you see some of the amazing traps that he has that he sets to get people in. You, if you've lived long, uh, any time at all, you know how Satan has trapped you and he's trapped me on many occasions. Well, if you got somebody that said, I'll live like this in the church, but you see outside of the church, that's a whole nother matter. Satan is setting a perfect trap to say, wow, 
Why would I ever want to go to a church there? You know how he conducts himself here at the workplace. You know what kind of neighbor he is. We need to guard preciously our reputation in the community and how we conduct ourselves, not only in church, but outside of the church. He also, and I'm going to lump these together. These come out of Titus. He loves what is good. He's upright and just. And isn't that an important quality that you would look for in an elder? That he's going to be fair. He's going to be just. He's not going to take sides, but he's going to hear both sides of the argument and give his best advice. He's going to be fair. He's going to be just. He's going to be holy. You're going to see spirituality, a love for God, a love for God's word, a love for the church, and a love for those that, uh, uh, that are outside the church that they're willing to share the gospel with them. And then lastly, that they're disciplined, very similar to that word self-discipline. But now we're going to move on to some of the negative characteristics. I think all of us could probably say this. You know, I have a story about an elder and something that he did or did to me or did to a church that I was in over the years. Probably every one of us could do some of that. We've heard a lot of those. In fact, I got a phone call uh, this week from another gospel minister, and we were talking about what we were going to be teaching on. He said, wow, I, I used to uh, preach at a little small church in, in another southern state, and they hadn't had eldership for years, and I was preaching through some of those texts that you're talking about, and then he was kind of admonished afterwards. They said, you know what happened the last time that we had elders? We had two elders, and they split the church. He said, we don't want to have that happen anytime soon. Now, that should not, just because that's a negative thing that happened, should not be a reason why we're not growing towards that. Maybe it may take years for that church to recover and start to equip and, and, and reach out and get those kind of qualified people in. And so maybe that tells us we really need to take these uh, qualifications, these qualities seriously so that issues like that don't happen. And so what what are some of those things they need to avoid? They need to not be given to drunkenness. Hendrickson, as he's commentating on this verse, says, the same author who advised Timothy to use a little wine for the sake of his stomach because of his frequent illness, it was a medicinal purpose, also clearly stated that the one who fails to practice moderation has no right to be an elder. A wine bibber, a tipper, a drunkard cannot be worthy of an overseer. Remember, these are examples. If somebody is so controlled by that, how could they be an example for the church? It says also that they're not to be violent. Literally, a bruiser. Somebody that's ready to throw punches. But they're not quarrelsome. They're not contentious. They're not disposed to fight. And I guess you could kind of put those three together. Because, you know, if you have a problem with alcohol, it often leads to being very argumentative and wanting to fight. Proverbs 20, verse 1 Wine's a mocker, beer's a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. Also says that in Titus 1 and 7 that they're not overbearing. That means self-will. That they have a stubborn spirit. They refuse to listen to other points of view. It's my way or the highway. And that's not the, the quality that we're looking for in somebody that's wanting to serve the church to be fair and to be balanced when, when approaching people. They're not overbearing. They're not quick-tempered. They're not prone to anger. Imagine, you go up and ask for, hey, here, you know, we don't have any Kleenex boxes over here in the classroom. And so the elder blessed you for asking a question like that. No, we don't want to have that kind of response from a, a leader, but they want to listen and want to try to help in any way that they can. Number six, they manage finances. It says that they're not a lover of money, and they do not pursue dishonest gain. So number one, they don't have a Judas-like spirit, because remember what Judas did. He was the caretaker over Jesus' financial ministry, and he used to help himself to the money bag regularly. So we want to make sure that they don't have that Judas-like spirit, and also that they don't have just a, a, a burning desire for material gain, that that's the important thing in their life, that they're just making money. And so this is somebody that, that understands finances, and uh, as, as Brother Kelly was uh, praying about, uh, you know, there's a big responsibility those elders have to disseminate these funds, but there's going to be a large budget that they're overseeing and that they're shepherding over, so they need to be people of great monetary integrity. Now, let me go ahead and summarize some of these negative uh, uh, things to avoid. Let's look at this. Number one, that's telling me 
that in the eldership, there's going to be some times of conflict. And I think whenever you deal with people, you're going to deal with problems. And so this needs to be a person that's, that's calm. They're not argumentative. They're not quick to fight, but they're willing to listen, that there's, there's a loving, there's a, there's a gentleness about them in their presentation. And just think, they're working in a group. They're working it with other men in this group, in this plurality of elders. And so they need to have a disposition that's able to hear different points of view without blowing up and getting all angry and upset and, and, and being violent about it. They need to be people of good integrity. Secondly, secondly, they need to have these positive qualities. They need to avoid these negative qualities. But there also needs to be something said about their families. First of all, we're going to start with companions. Let's start, uh, well, that's the money one. Let's start with companions. The husband of one wife or faithful to one wife. As you go through all of these uh, qualities and qualifications, every single one of them is important. It, for whatever reason, this one tends to get the most weight put on it. I think we ought to have equal distribution on this. Now, um, the requirement, obviously, husband of one wife would rule out a polygamist, somebody that has more than one wife. It would rule out a single man. It would rule out a female serving in this role. Emphasis is on male spiritual leadership. Now, the obvious candidate would be one who has only been married one time. And historically, that's what we generally see. But, again, that's where you don't want to have a hyper, ultra, legalistic approach to some of these things. What about a widower who was remarried? Technically, he would have had two wives throughout the course of his life. Now, he's not a bigamist. He only has one wife at a time. He obviously has scriptural right to remarry. And we could go up with a thousand different scenarios. I think the underlying point that's being made here, this needs to be a person that has demonstrated faithfulness to his wife. In fact, the 2011 NIV is, is, puts it that way, faithful to his wife. And that's what you know our other NIV says over here in chapter 5 about widows that were being put on that list needed to be 60 years old. They needed to be one woman, uh, you know, they only need to have one husband. And I notice that it's translated there that they're faithful to their husband. And scholars kind of breaking this down said it really isn't focusing on just the number. Somebody like uh, David Instone Brewer says, Timothy was being told to make sure, make sure that elders and deacons were not sexually immoral, which was extremely difficult in that society. When you think of these cultures there in Crete, um, in Ephesus, these Gentile, heathen, pagan cultures, immorality was very, very accepted and practiced. And so those that would serve in the Lord's church, they needed to be people that were committed and faithful to their wife. So there needs to be this quality about companions, but also about children, too, about children. Let's focus in on some of this. He must manage his family well, that his children obey him with proper respect. Titus says it's a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of, of being wild and disobedient. That makes sense, doesn't it? That in his home, he has learned how to be an influencer in positive ways. Influencing them for the way of Christ. Influencing them in faith in Christ. That they're not wild and rebellious, that they're listening to him. How can he influence somebody in the church if he doesn't have control of his own household? But there also needs to be some competence that they have as well. They need to have some competence and some comprehension. They need to be able to teach, and he needs to hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it's been taught so that they can encourage others by sound doctrine or refute those that oppose it, Titus chapter 1, verse 9. He needs to know the Word of God. He needs to be able to speak the Word of God, to teach it, whether that's in a public way or more in a private setting so that they know how to discern sound doctrine, good, healthy doctrine, and then when false doctrine comes that way, that they're able to expose that and get people to believing and practicing the truth once again. And sometimes that kind of marries itself with hospitality. You know, some of the best teaching can come over a cup of coffee with somebody. Sometimes the best teaching is, hey, come over to our house and let's talk about some of these matters. Let's study God's word. So there needs to be an understanding and ability to teach the word of God. And then the, the final one I want us to look at, 
There needs to be a completeness about this candidate. He must not be a recent convert, or he could become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. Now, literally, that word means newly planted, a new convert, a neophyte. Well, and why is that? Well, he could become conceited. He could become arrogant, and that's what caused the devil to fall. See, pride could overcome this novice Christian, go to his head. Secondly, he would lack the mature, mature spiritual mentality to know how to handle difficult situations. I thought this was extremely interesting. Article written by uh, Brother Ed Wharton in the Gospel Advocate on the Eldership, on the age of elders in the first century. In Greco-Roman society in which Paul lived and wrote, the age of an elder was viewed to begin on or about the 40th year. This is significant for the church today, which has seen men in their mid-30s rationalize their age into the eldership. The concern here is not merely academic, but practical and scriptural. An elder must pos possess maturity that only adequate time and experience can provide. So that's what the word elder means. It means an older man. And it's going to be amazing as you look back on your life, you live long enough, how much you change from decade to decade. Things that maybe in your early 30s really got under your skin you had no knowledge of, by the time that you're 40 and 50, it's really not an issue at all. Because you've grown in your understanding of how to work with people. Uh, your children have uh, been under your influence. You've been able to work with them. You've had more life experience, and so there's more to pull from. So we're talking about somebody that's complete, that's mature, that's not a new Christian. So today, as we're looking at many of these qualities, and these qualifications, I want to say this. In my 50 years growing up in the church, here's what I'd like to say about elderships that I've been able to be influenced by, raised up under, have been privileged to work with over the years. Here's things that I've noticed. Number one, they have been men of great example and love and spirituality for their wives and their children. I've seen that so many times. I've seen men who are excellent Bible students, tremendous communicators of the Word of God. I've seen men that are respected by their jobs. And what a joy that is when I get to meet people around town and they say, hey, this so-and-so is a member of your church. Oh, we really like them. We really appreciate it. They're such a great example. What a joy it is to hear those kinds of things said about fellow members. These are men who help their wives and are very hospitable. They like people, and they like having folks over and interacting with them. They're men who attend all the services of the church, Bible class, worship services, small groups, Sunday evening services, Wednesday night, and oftentimes when members have gone home for the day, the elders are laboring long in the night, praying for members, setting up opportunity to encourage and to reach out, and to spend time separate and apart from regular church services because they want to be good examples. They want to take their ministry, this noble task, seriously. I've, I've noticed that over the years. I've seen men that are courageous in times of crisis, very compassionate in times of loss. I'll never forget when I went home after my mother had passed when I was just 21 years old. Elders were in the house that I came home to, we were all keeping our composure together until one of the elders said, Wayne, come over here. And we just wept in each other's arms. Isn't that the kind of people that you're looking for to be leaders in the church that love you, that are compassionate, courageous in times of crisis? I've seen that. I've experienced that in my life. Personally, I've been blessed by their wisdom, their work, the wholesome support of the elders. And so as we think about, Lord willing, in the new year, of adding some additional shepherds to the congregation here at Eastwood, I'd encourage all of us to look at these qualities once again from Titus chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 3, but consider, consider the outcome of their way of life. Imitate their faith. Look at their faith that they have. Look at their faithfulness. Look at their family. Look at those personal characteristics. Do they have those things in there that they need to have? Or are they avoiding those negative traits that I've talked about? And for those that get selected to be able to serve the local congregation, 
Oh, what a great blessing the Lord has in store for you one of these days. As you serve faithfully in his kingdom, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away, 1 Peter chapter 4, 5 and verse 4. Church, we're going to offer the invitation here this morning. I admonished us at the very beginning, maybe as we go through some of these traits, these characteristics, to kind of do assessment of where you stand at here uh, spiritually and personally today. Perhaps there's somebody that their heart has been touched, they'd like to respond to the gospel. If there's anything that we could do or our shepherds can do to serve you this morning, won't you come as we stand and sing this selected song? Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, we'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Before I give my special announcement, I want each and every one of you to know, it's hard to say this without crying, the elders love this congregation, and we love serving this congregation, and we thank you for your fellowship. I think we're doing it right, and we think we're doing it biblically. Thank you. It, that's okay. Thanks. About, I spent a long time in, in the grocery business retail with Dillon's, about 30 years worth. And I've heard a saying over and over again while I was in that uh, grocery store. My manager always told me, volume covers a multitude of sins. Now, you're thinking, what's that got to do with anything? Okay, if you've been with us on Wednesday night and you've been watching the Stafford North series on video, you know that he's been telling us to, he says this, but he means this, right? So, when, when we're talking about how volume covers a multitude of sins, what he's really telling us is the sales, if the sales are high enough, it'll cover pilferage, it'll cover um, uh, damaged goods, it'll cover anything that comes toward that store that's going to hinder us from making a profit. Because that's what that actually means. And if they don't have the numbers or the volume, the sales that's high enough and people tend to go somewhere else maybe because of competition maybe that's Walmart Sam's all these you name it then their sales goes down and they get themselves in trouble well 
That happens sometimes in the church, so to speak. Now, we have competition also. It's not Aldi's, it's not Sam's, and it's not uh, Walmart. Our competition in the past year or two has been COVID-19. COVID-19 has put us in a pressure situation, and we have to decide what we need to do about it. Now, in the future, 2022, we're going to adjust our budget to, uh, uh, you know, to go along with this so that we can deal with it. But that's later. For the rest of this year and maybe part of January, we're trying to figure out what we want to do. We're thinking that probably we need to make this announcement because maybe we need to take that spiritual uh, cart, grocery cart, take it down the aisle maybe one more time before we go to the check stands, and maybe throw a few more items in there so that when we do get to the check stands to check out, the volume will be there for the rest of the year. Now, I don't know if you looked at the bulletin lately, but we're about 73000 down from our uh, budget. We can handle that. that I mean, what we mean is we can take care of that, so to speak, a little bit. But what we are having our trouble with now is we're going down a little bit below our expenditures, which now we're starting to get ourselves in a little bit of trouble. So we're asking you, if you would, please take your grocery cart down the cart, down the aisle, maybe throw a few more items in there before you go to the checkout to check out. And maybe that'll help us to take care of it for the rest of the year before next year gets here. So with that in mind, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, we thank you for allowing us to, to, to give the way that we could. We allow, thank you for our jobs. We thank you for America. We just thank you for allowing us for the blessings that we have because we're here today. We thank you for Jesus Christ. And Father, we know in the future it's not going to be especially easy because COVID is still around us. We don't know how much longer it's going to be with us, but we need to prepare for it. We need to thank you, Father, for what we have and our blessings that we have, and we're doing that at this point in time. Help us to, Father, especially this time of year, during the holiday season, we realize it's not a good time to make this kind of announcement, but we're in a need at this point in time, and we pray that you would help us to do that, such a thing. Thank you, Father, for the gifts of, of giving. We thank you, Father, for Eastwood and the way that they have given in the past, and it's our prayer that in the future they will do the same. We thank you for these people, and we thank you for the church that Jesus died for. We just ask you to help us in this, in this future state. We just thank you that we're all together here as a family, and families need to stay together and stick together in times and uh, uh, situations like this. And when we're happy, we're happy. And when we're sad, we're sad. We need to lean on one another. And we need to thank you, Father, for everything that we have, whether it's good or bad. or whether it's, We just know that all perfect and good gifts come from you. And we want that to happen at this point in time also for our future. We just thank you for the lesson that Wayne has given this morning. We pray for leadership in the future of this church. And we just thank you that it's going on right now. We thank you for the fellowship. We thank you, Father, for the way that you've organized your church. And we can read that in our scripture that Wayne's brought out this morning. We thank you for that. And it's an organization that's, that's set well. And, Father, we just know that you knew what you were doing when you put these things in here. And you know that you allowed us to do these things. And not that any of us are perfect, but we're trying our best to guide the flock the way that we the way that you would like us to do it. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for the uh, worship that we've had this morning. We pray that that has been done in spirit and in truth, that we can go away from here being edified and spiritually lifted. We just thank you for all things that have gone on this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, you may go get your children from Bible bar, uh, please. Um, <clears throat> Find us together, Lord, find us together, Lord, join the and be broken. Find us together, Lord, find us together, Lord, blind us together with love. There is only one God, there is only one King. There is only Find us together, Lord, find us together with lords that cannot be broken. Find us together, Lord, find us together, Lord, find us together with love. 
You are dismissed.